strengths I have is I have a loud voice, uh, which in my university normally we don't need, because one of the things about this university is we have a, a strong policy of lecture capture. We have 20,000 students, not all on campus, there's some 16,000 on campus. Uh, our teaching staff, of course, are constantly under pressure, partly from me to do more, to contribute really effective teaching to our undergraduates, our postgraduate taught and our postgraduate research community. And so research capture helps us make sure that all of our students get access to our lectures. I'm failing on research capture today because they can't record me. So my apologies for shouting out loud. But that aside, it's great pleasure for me to uh, open this <coughs> unit today and to welcome our esteemed guests, I'm not going to try and, and capture all of them, because if I do try to capture all of them, inevitably I will forget some. But let me at least recognise Minister Palat Mustafa. Minister Palat, it's delightful to have you here. I know you're only in Leicester for a short time, and you'll fit some meetings in London in today, and then go back to Istanbul. I'm delighted that you were able to uh, make the journey to join us here. And welcome indeed. Let me also welcome Dr. Mohammed Mokhtar, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Kurdistan. My university and uh, Dr. Mokhtar's university, of course, already have a, had a relationship before we started this unit. And it's fantastic for us to continue to maintain that and I hope uh, grow it together. Welcome, Dr. Mokhtar. Let me also welcome the uh, President of Kurdistan's newest university, Dr. Michael Milnix. Michael is telling me that uh, he's been going now for two years in the university and already has 500 students. I think that's exceptional performance, particularly in, in, in the region as we've gone through this period of difficulty in the economy. Welcome indeed, Dr. Milnix, and I hope we develop a relationship as you go forward and we do here uh, in Leicester. And finally, let me... Uh, uh, recognize Mr. Karavan Tahir, representative of the Kurdistan Regional Government in the UK. Mr. Tahir is uh, honored by your presence today. Thank you. There are a number of other very, very important people here today. Of course, the all-party parliamentary group on the Kurdistan region in Iraq. We recognize very much uh, Mr. Kent's your work and the work of that group. It's particularly opposite for me to welcome this group of esteemed individuals and all of you here today, uh, particularly on the Halabza Memorial Day. Mariana has asked us to recognize that day and I'm uh, honored to do so. And it gels well with this university because the University of Leicester was established a little bit less than 100 years ago as a living memorial to those who sacrificed themselves in the First World War, 1914-1918 war. And as we move forwards to a point where we are recognizing our 100th anniversary, then 
re-establishing ourselves as a university that celebrates sacrifice and puts education and learning at the core of societal cohesion and societal healing, I think is very much in line with the theme of, of many of the efforts of people in this room. And I'm particularly struck at the moment by your remarks in the inauguration of your university on generating the next generation of leaders as well as educating individuals in taking Kurdistan as, as a beacon of hope and stability in a complex region forward. Uh, and I congratulate you and your colleagues uh, for doing that. The conference, of course, that you're about to uh, begin is on the role of the Kurds in the Middle East and beyond, regional and international interactions. Well, uh, I'm a Scotsman, and the Scots have spent their life travelling elsewhere and trying <coughs> to influence uh, uh, that world. And the Kurds have done exactly the same. The influence of the Kurds worldwide, uh, whether thinking about their own region of Kurdistan or more generally, has been profound and continues to be. Uh, of course, Scotland has a homeland. Uh, I think First Minister Nicola Sturgeon wants to make it a homeland independent from the country I was born into, but that's, that's her challenge. And Kurdistan, of course, the situation is, it continues to be more complex. Uh, and what I'd like to see is that this unit, so the research that it leads, to the people that it brings to Leicester, creates a place for us to have an ongoing intellectual discussion, a discussion based on scholarship around the role of Kurdistan and around the nature of Kurds in our broader community. So, uh, Mariana and Omar, who uh, run the unit here, I congratulate you on choosing this topic uh, for the first symposium, that what I hope will be uh, a regular series of symposium uh, run by our Kurdistan Studies, uh, Kurdistan International Studies Unit. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. To Leicester. Uh, I do hope you have a, a fruitful and exciting day. You certainly have a, a, a packed programme and I suspect that's enough from uh, uh, this university leadership. Um, I should just simply finish by saying that uh, one of the things that we announced last week was the creation of a new national space park uh, here in Leicester. I'm delighted by that investment from our government. And my friend and colleague, President and Vice-Chancellor Paul Boyle, I'm afraid this morning is very much engaged in the launch of that space park, otherwise uh, he would be here with you. Uh, I think going forward together and uh, using our space data to understand uh, some of the challenges in Kurdistan, I hope will be a future research agenda for us all. I wish you well in the conference. Thank you. marking the 29th, 29th years since the chemical weapons attack in their city in which 5,000 people were killed and thousands more were injured. I would like to express my condolences and solidarity with the victims of Halabja genocide and to honor all the victims of genocide in Kurdistan, Iraq, and around the world, including those suffering under ISIS. I would like to thank the University of Leicester and the School of History, Politics, and International Relations for hosting this symposium to launch the Kurdistan International Studies Unit. It's an honor to be at the inauguration of such a significant academic endeavor. There was a time not so long ago when to utter the word Kurdistan was taboo, at a time when our story was told by our enemies and adversaries, and our culture, language, and history were denied. To see that today a prestigious British university is launching an international Kurdish studies unit is a testament of how far Kurdistan has come. In responding to Professor Galepsi's words, I would like to set out the challenges and opportunities 
we face in Kurdistan, and later talk about the role of academic study and international research. Current situation in Kurdistan region. Today, the Kurdistan region in Iraq finds itself at yet another critical juncture. Our Peshmerga, alongside coalition partners and Iraqi security forces, are closing in on the Islamic State's so-called caliphate, which we believe will soon end. The liberation of Mosul is well underway. Soon after that, the towns of Tel Afar and Hawija will need to be liberated. But the question is, then what? What will Kurdistan region and Iraq look like after the Islamic State has been destroyed? The trauma, destruction, and wounds created by ISIS will not heal for some time, if ever. How can the Christians, Yazidis, and other persecuted by, other persecuted by ISIS return to their homes in safety and dignity? For safety and dignity. Wherever ISIS has been, it has brought about destruction of the infrastructure, it has mined and booby trapped homes and has destroyed or sold the cultural and religious heritage of ancient communities. It has displaced about 3 million people, half of them are in Kurdistan. They can only return home once there is decontamination of the mines and bombs, there is some reconstruction <coughs> and stabilization. Perhaps most important of all, there needs to be an agreement on how we will all live together in the future. The Yazidis and Christians rightly say they want guarantees of protection. We in Kurdistan seek self-determination. Others have different demands. We all want justice and accountability. But it appears not justice, but it appears that justice means different things to different people in Iraq. How can all these different views of the future, all these demands, be aligned together? That is the challenge facing us as our Peshmerga Iraqi forces and the coalition tighten the news around ISIS's neck. Humanitarian and economic challenges facing the region today. While the military plan progresses, we are still left with an overwhelming humanitarian crisis that has not improved since it was first declared as level three emergency by the United Nations in August 2014. Since that time, about one and a half million fellow Iraqis have fled ISIS to Kurdistan. Among them are Christians, Yazidis, Shabak, Kakis, Turkmen, Shia, and Sunni Arabs. In the two years before the arrival, their arrival, Kurdistan region received already about 300,000 Syrian refugees, most of whom are still in Kurdistan and are unlikely to return home soon. As a result of this influx of refugees and internally displaced people, our population has risen from 5 million to about 7 million in Kurdistan. I'm proud that the people of Kurdistan have borne the responsibility to protect those fleeing from, for their lives with open hearts despite the cost to their economy, jobs, and public services, which are stretched to breaking point. In addition to the hit on our economy, the trauma that displaced and, the, that displaced and refugees have continued to suffer has often been described as a ticking time bomb. Imagine a child of seven leaving Syria in 2012 and coming to Kurdistan. He or she is now 12 years old. For a child who fled ISIS in 2014, these children have seen terrible things, tragedies, violence, and cruelty beyond our imagination. Their education and health have suffered, despite our and the UN's best efforts to support them. There are children, especially among the Yazidis, who have lost every member of their family. The future of our nation, the future of Iraq and the region is partly in their hands. They represent a generation whose suffering and trauma comes after decades of genocide and oppression in Iraq and Syria. How do we ensure that future generations don't endure a similar fate? 
How can we stop the cycle of violence in Iraq and the Middle East? How can we ensure that the next generation of Kurds will be the first for decades, if not a century, not to see a massacre or genocide? I'd also like to talk about the economy of Kurdistan region today. In addition to the reconstruction, stabilization, and justice I mentioned earlier, economic independence and well-being has to be a part of our future. Kurdistan region rose out of the ashes of decades of genocide and Arabization to create an oil industry from scratch, to attract billions of dollars of foreign direct investment to open the economy to entrepreneurship and enterprise. Some have described this period from 2003 to 2013 as a golden decade when Kurdistan flourished, not just economically and culturally, but also socially, with civil society and the media starting to play a greater role. The shocks to our economy in 2014, the war with ISIS, the interests of IDPs, the fall in oil prices, have reversed some of the gains that we made and exposed areas that we had failed to develop to maturity. The Kurdistan regional government has always acknowledged that it needs to invest in capacity building and in strengthening our institutions. These will become more critical as we go forward, and I believe that academic institutions like the University of Leicester can contribute to this in close cooperation with the prestigious universities in Kurdistan region. Also tied to the economic situation, is our KRG reform agenda and policy. I would like to assure you that KRG is committed to the reform and we have already started to take serious steps in this direction. The audits in the oil and gas sector, the biometric legislation, the austerity measures, and other steps that have been taken by KRG in cooperation with the World Bank are all testament to what we stand for. I would also like to talk about the area of foreign and international relations of the KRG. Another area where Kurdistan has flourished in the years since 2003 is foreign relations. While the KRG representations abroad began to be appointed in Europe and the United States in the late 90s, it wasn't until 2006 that my institution, which is the Department of Foreign Relations, was created. Today, we have 14 KRG representations overseas, including the one in the UK, and over 30 diplomatic missions based in Kurdistan region. And the last has been from Armenia, which was announced and declared a couple of days ago that they would come and establish a consulate general in Erbil. In addition to the European Union mission and the United Nations Assistant Mission for Iraq, UNAM. Kurdistan region has forged good relations with countries around the world and sometimes turned hostility into acceptance. For example, our relations with Turkey have changed from the days when Ankara was preparing to invade in Kurdistan, in, invade Iraqi Kurdistan, to an era of cooperation and not confrontation. Our international relations have also strengthened through the presence of counter ISIS coalition countries that diplomatic and military representatives and advisors have been able to see at first hand the reality in Kurdistan. For example, our strong belief in religious freedom and peaceful coexistence, our commitment to democracy and our vision for the future. We know that many Christian partners have better understanding today of our desire for self-determination than that before. We also know that both regional and international players acknowledge that decisions can no longer be made with that, about the Middle East or Iraq without taking into account the will of the people of Kurdistan. Role of the academic research. Having set out the challenges and opportunities facing Kurdistan region, 
I would like to turn to the role of the academic research and study. As I said at the beginning, at one time, it would have been impossible or unimaginable for a Kurdish minister to address a British university that is embarking on a Kurdish studies program. We have all come very far, but we have still further way to go, and academic inquiry and research can help, not only as in Kurdistan, but also the international community, academics and future historians to understand Kurdistan and its people. I would like to commend the University of Leicester and its School of History, Politics and International Relations for launching the Kurdistan International Studies Unit. I am certain it will have a bright future and will contribute greatly towards a deeper understanding of Kurdistan, its people, its role and potential. I would also like to end by saying that KRG and Kurdistan region stands for partnership. We need you to be, uh, to be our partners in the difficult and challenging but we are optimistic about our future, as Kurds are known to be a culture of hope and optimism. Thank you. Vice-Chancellor of the Kurdistan University in Aulia, with all the great academic achievements that our university represents today, but also as a Kurd on this very special day, March 16th, will be forever engraved on the heart and in the minds of the Kurds, and increasingly the international community at large. March 16, 1988, was a massacre against the Kurds in the closing days of the Iran-Iraq war, a massacre inflicted by Saddam Hussein, which killed 5,000 civilians of the town of Rabja and injured and maimed a further 10,000 through chemical weapons. Rabja is now officially the largest chemical attack on the civilian populated area in history. In the history of Kurds, Persecution has dominated the narrative. Nevertheless, there are two ways to deal with this persecution and the resultant hurt. One way is revenge, which then becomes an endless of cycle and violence cycle of violence. The other way, the preferred choice of our Kurdish nation and leaders is to learn and move forward. Our educational institution should reflect this approach and certainty for the university of Kurdistan Hawler, we choose a strategy for forward thinking, diversity, inclusion, and to develop students and graduate 
with mature and intelligent inquiry, minds equipped for change. This strategy, I strongly believe, will help us move forward as a nation. It was therefore with great interest that I saw the message of the Kurdish factor in the changing face of the Middle East today. It's embedded in all of today's workshop. From foreign policies to sustainability and development to culture, heritage, and conflict resolution. These themes touch every moment of history being made right now for the cares in the Middle East. And so, in summary, the importance of this symposium is multi-faced. It's a day of reflection, honoring our Kurdish martyrs of Halabja. It's a day to share knowledge and persecution of Kurdistan with our colleagues in UK and Kurdistan universities. It's also a day to look forward to the future and realize our great potential for collaborating together in ideas and solutions for a better future. This symposium is a great message of solidarity and hope that in our two nations, and indeed the entire international academic community, is reaching out and collaborating on key issues for the cares and putting the spotlight on the role of our people in the Middle East and beyond. For over 11 years now, the University of Kurdistan Hawlair has stood in the very center of development in Kurdistan. Our location in the capital city of Erbil is pivotal and communicates a powerful message of hopes through higher education. Kurdistan next generation of leaders and active citizens in business industry, health, and education sector, and the wider community are being nurtured and uh, developed by the exceptional international academic staff and supportive administration. The overarching mission and the vision for academic excellence will be our constant measure and continue to set Un University of Kurdistan Hawlair apart year on year. In the last few years, the region has been challenged by destructive enemy of Kurdistan and a civilized war seeking to, to destroy all the great things we have built. Despite this challenging geopolitical climate, UKH will continue to be imbued with values that we will embrace and practice in the process of educating our people. Our values in some case, a healthy choice, a healthy pride in our student state, and ongoing achievement, the UK Edge brand is focusing forward on being student centric. Our students are our lifeblood and drive 
our motivation as educators to support and honor them by providing the best education possible, not just by imparting knowledge and factual learning, but in helping them grow to be self-assured individual and socially responsible citizens. This is the vision for healthy future healed from an oppressive past. And so ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for inviting me to deliver an opening speech on this great Memorial Day. I hope it encouraged and inspired you and I wish you all an enjoyable and fruitful symposium. Thanks a lot. by several faculty at my institution who will be giving presentations today, and also by my wife sitting there, Dr. Esther Molnix, former president of the American University of Iraq and Suleymaniya, a rather interesting situation where we were sort of bookends of university presidents at different parts of the country at the same time. Wow. <laughs> anyway, she's filling in today for someone at my university who was denied a visa here. It's regrettable that entry restrictions into various nations is happening in our global society today. It's highly regrettable that the President of the United States feels it necessary to restrict entry to six nations with a predominantly Muslim population. My hope is that this is a one-time occurrence and that the United States will soon again be known as it has always been known as a safe haven for all. May you live in interesting times. This is an English expression, purported to be a translation of a traditional Chinese curse. While seemingly a blessing, the expression is always used ironically, with the implication that interesting times of peace and tranquility are more life-enhancing than interesting ones. From a historical perspective, and usually would include some sort of mayhem, killing, Conflict. Anyway, may we find ourselves soon again living in less interesting times, and may peace and tranquility spread throughout the globe. However, my friends, I have to admit that I'm somewhat skeptical that the MENA region will find tranquility anytime soon. If peace is to be found, then I firmly believe it is education that will lead us there. Indeed, it has been demonstrated time and again that a quality form of education can help prevent violence. Formal education provides an opportunity for individuals to learn important social skills, critical thinking skills, problem-solving strategies, and communication skills. All of these are great alternatives to mindless, heedless violence. A few months ago, Education International published an article stating that, and I quote, Education is the key to United Na uniting nations to bringing human beings more closely together. In many parts of the world, civil society suffers because of situations of violent conflict and war. It is important to recognize the crucial role of education in contributing to building a culture of peace and condemning instances in which education is undermined in order to attack democracy and tolerance. The culture of peace and nonviolence goes to the substance of fundamental human rights, social justice, democracy, literacy, respect and dignity for all, international solidarity, 
respect for workers' rights and core labor standards, children's rights, equality between men and women, cultural identity and diversity, indigenous people and minority rights, and the preservation of the natural environment. <clears throat> Without question, quality education is one of the best antidotes to extremist violent behavior. When education is poor or lacking altogether due to war or other violent activity, then the culture of violence continues unabated. Again, according to Education International, education is a key tool in combating poverty, in promoting peace, social justice, human rights, democracy, cultural diversity, and environmental awareness. Education for peace implies an active concept of peace through values, life skills, and knowledge in the spirit of equality, respect, empathy, understanding, and mutual appreciation among individuals, groups, and nations. A culture of peace must take root in the classroom from an early age. It must continue to be reflected in the curricula at secondary and tertiary levels. However, the skills for peace and nonviolence can only be learned and perfected through practice. Active listening, dialogue, mediation, and cooperative learning are delicate skills to develop. This is education in the widest sense. It is a dynamic, long-term process, a lifetime experience. It means providing both children and adults with an understanding of and respect for university, universal rights and values. It requires partici participation at all levels, family, school, places of work, newsrooms, playgrounds, and the community as well as the nation. Any attempt at establishing a culture of peace through education was lost in the 1980s when Saddam Hussein gained control and began his systematic persecution of various ethnicities and political parties. A number of university professors, among other intellectuals, were imprisoned. Higher education went into a state of decline that lasts to this day. Iraq had never experienced such a brain drain as in the Saddam and post-Saddam the academic elite were hunted. Professors, teachers, doctors, lawyers, and politicians were shot, kidnapped, and threatened. Since 2014, the arrival of ISIS in Iraq has caused matters to grow even worse. In the first few months of 2016, there were almost weekly suicide bombings in Baghdad. As a direct result, the educational sector has continued to decline. There seems almost no hope to restore the halcyon days of educational excellence. I became president of the American University of Kurdistan at the same time my wife, Esther, was provost and interim president of the American University of Iraq in Suleimania. This was at the same time ISIS claimed the city of Mosul, only about 40 minutes from Duhok, where I live. And what we now realize, my wife and I, was rather a naive hope we believe that cooperation between the faculty at our two institutions would go a long way in solving the differences between the political parties in the region and paving the way toward a long desired peace. Even if that dream didn't materialize, we continue to believe that access to higher education is a key element in ending the violence in the region and helping to solve the political and social, social instability in Iraq and Kurdistan. I do have reason to hope. AUK is one of only two not-for-profit institutions of higher education in all of Iraq and Kurdistan. It was founded with a commitment to offer a liberal arts education to students of all economic, political, cultural, and religious backgrounds. The language of the instruction is English, and only those students who can provide high level, who can prove high-level English proficiency are allowed to enter the university. The style of education we provide is quite unique to Kurdistan. The goal is to develop English proficiency, critical thinking skills, love for lifelong learning, good citizenship, and personal integrity. Education in my institution is values-based. Students are being educated to become global citizens with respect for different races, creeds, political persuasions, and more. Excellence at AUK 
is demonstrated by the creation of a robust, challenging curriculum featuring innovative academic programs with performance indicators and student outcomes clearly identified. It is recognized at AUK that graduating students will enter a global society and, as a result, internationalization of our curriculum is the key. As the world grows increasingly smaller, internationalization of the curriculum is not only the smart thing to do, it is the right thing to do. At AUK, we ask our students to increase their knowledge of other cultures, traditions, religions, politics, and languages from all parts of the world. Students are taught to be multicultural and tolerant of all races, creeds, and political affiliation. This kind of inclusive education is the best and fastest way to combat extremist groups such as the so-called Islamic State. It is the best and fastest way to bring peace to our world. In closing, let me just say how honored we are to be included in this forum. It is my sincere hope that lasting partnerships may be built among the, par among the people participating here today. Working together, we can do far more than we can working separately. Working together, we can bring peace and stability to Kurdistan and to Iraq. The answer, I believe, is education. And as educators, it is up to us to advance a culture of peace. Thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Deniz Zekici. I am the executive director of the Kurdish Policy Research Center uh, based in Washington, D.C. And I'm also a lecturer at the University of California, Berkeley. I would like to welcome you all to this important symposium, which marks the launch of the Kurdistan International Studies Unit at the University of Leicester. <coughs> so I would like to thank uh, Professor uh, Ian Gillespie, my esteemed colleagues, uh, Mariana Damer, and uh, Karzan, and other dedicated people who made this fantastic symposium happen. The fact that many of you have traveled long distances is to remind us all just how important our work is. That's why I'm truly delighted and honored to be a part of this <coughs> gathering, and I'm excited to hear about uh, wonderful works that we are going to present today. I myself uh, will be presenting uh, a paper too, so I'm prepared, uh, I have prepared myself to be challenged, excited, and inspired. Uh, although it is now emerging as a topic of high interest, uh, the field of uh, Kurdish studies remains understudied compared to other area studies. Therefore, it is uh, wholly inspiring to see major universities like the University of Leicester devote more resources to much needed interdisciplinary scholarly research on uh, Kurds and Kurdistan. I hope that our universities follow suit, uh, uh, other universities follow suit by initiating uh, and developing their own Kurdish studies programs. And it seems that this hope will turn into a reality very soon as we witness an extraordinary surge of interest in Kurdistan, uh, in Kurd and Kurdistan, uh, which will contribute to uh, establishing Kurdish studies as a regular uh, field of uh, academic study at universities. The field of Kurdish studies is also developing in the U.S. Uh, a number of universities have initiated their own programs, uh, including uh, Indiana University. Uh, University of Cal um, Indiana University, the, the, the University of Central Florida, the Middle Tennessee State University, and a number of non-academic institutions. The University of California, Berkeley, also started its own pilot program two years ago, and I'm humbled to be a part of uh, that effort. We are hoping to find the resources to turn this pilot program into uh, a permanent minor in our uh, Near Eastern Studies uh, department. <coughs> so, fingers crossed. Finally, as I heard, uh, I appreciate that the organizers of this symposium ha have dedicated uh, this symposium to the victims of Halabja. And finally, uh, let's make this symposium a, a marvelous scientific and social <coughs> event, and I wish you all a wonderful day of scholarly activities. Thank you.
بس كان هو من دستا أو بس كان في سبب في أي من الجاد اللي شكل سبب إنجليش كذا كان في نودي لون كان في كان أكيد إذا لم دلاك في الباك جين في سبب بيوتيفول تاون My name is Abdelaziz Sagir, I'm from Saudi Arabia, and I came all the way from Saudi Arabia to appreciate what this university is doing, to launch a special center and a special unit in, in the Kurdistan itself. I do hope that this unit will develop to a year Middle East center, because Kurdistan will be very important for all the north parts of the Middle East. It will be important for Iraq, for Syria, for Iran, and for Turkey. So the whole Kurdish issue will be very important. I had the chance last year to be in Suleymaniyya <coughs> with the American University uh, that have attended their conference. And I do hope next year our plan to be in Erbil. Uh, last time again I was in Erbil was 1981. Now you can tell I'm not that young. <laughs> I know I pretend to be young, but still, you know, I'm not that young. Uh, and I do hope we will visit again there. The most important, I founded uh, the Gulf Research Center myself in 19, uh, sorry, in 2000. So 17 years already since I have founded the Gulf Research Center. We started in Dubai and we expanded uh, to Saudi Arabia and then Geneva, uh, later on was to Cambridge. And in Cambridge we have an annual conference called the Gulf Research Meeting. And we will be more than delighted, you know, we do it in a format of a 20 workshop conference. So there is a 600 scholars from all of all from 83 countries attending our annual Gulf Research Meeting. We will be more than happy to host a special workshop on the Gulf of Kurdistan. And I'm sure Dr. Marina that she have uh, invited me four years ago at Reading University at that time when she was there uh, in a special also conference in Kurdistan. You can tell I'm a friend of the Kurds and I uh, like the people. I appreciate them and I feel sympathy, a great sympathy to all uh, what they have been going through uh, suffering. I remember Halabcha very well at that time and what have happened, and we all felt extremely sorry for uh, the innocent people that it was almost uh, a determined genocide to be killed at that time. Uh, I'm delighted to see that there is a great development. Uh, I'm sure they are uh, able and capable uh, in, in fighting a lot of the difficult time, whether it's economic or political. They have contributed significantly to the Iraqi people, whether they are the Shia or the Sunni side, although I don't like to talk about sectarian or uh, this part, but still uh, they have accommodated many, many millions of people from the, the Shia side and the Sunni side in Iraq. It was highly appreciated by us on the Gulf side. We really felt that they were a true brother for uh, the, the, you know, the other part of the Iraqi people when they have hosted them, accommodated them, feed them, and give them a safe uh, place uh, to stay. Uh, this is a wonderful start, uh, and I'm sure we will all be keen uh, as a different uh, researcher or scholar interested in the, uh, in the, in the field uh, of, of Middle East study. Uh, we hope, as I said in the beginning, that this unit will develop to be a Middle East center. This country has been well known for studying uh, many, uh, you know, having a different center about Middle East, but I'm sure there is a great desire to have uh, you know, such a center focusing on many of the issues. Uh, 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 thank you very much for all of you. I enjoyed very much listening to the, uh, uh, the different speech. Thank you for the uh, Leicester University for this kind of invitation. And I do hope uh, we will uh, meet and we will continue uh, you know, the collaboration between our center, the Gulf Research Center, and the uh, new unit uh, here at the university we will be more than happy to extend our experience. Uh, we do have an annual um, publication, an annual conference, many of our workshop, and we do uh, you know, plenty of things that relate to the region. But I'm delighted to see many of the special scholars from different parts and different places, uh, not only from Kurdistan, but also delighted to meet the uh, senior uh, you know, faculty <coughs> members from the different universities. Thank you very much, and I hope we have uh, a great day today. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you all once again, uh, a special recording at the end for me. Um, we are continuing at 11 o'clock, from 11 o'clock onwards with uh, the workshop, the different workshop. You can find the location of the different workshop in the front.
اما تنیا و تارکانی کرد نوابو کنفرانس کن ساعت جورشوب کن ساعت یازده دسپرکن. آتا نگم.